All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started for this morning's virtual breakfast. My name is Steve Whittington. I'm a field crops educator with MSU Extension based out of Montcalm County, and I'll be your host for this morning's virtual breakfast. I'm excited to host this morning's virtual breakfast, uh, joined by Mike Staten and Jeff Andresen. Mike is a soybean educator with MSU Extension, and today he's gonna be discussing equipping operating sprayers um, in soybeans primarily. And then after that, we're gonna be joined by our MSU climatologist, Jeff Andresen. We'll discuss upcoming weather trends. Mike, let's go ahead and get your show popped up and we'll get started. As Steve said, I'm gonna be talking about equipping and operating boom sprayers to control insects and diseases in soybeans. And this presentation is put together in conjunction with Dr. Earl Ozkan from Ohio State University. He's an ag engineer that's worked very aggressively in this area. The reason we wanna talk about this subject is it's a little bit different um, when we're trying to control insects, diseases, or even apply a foliar fertilizer to soybeans than it is to control weeds. And the reason is we have to increase our coverage so much better. We gotta penetrate, the droplets have to penetrate that canopy and we have to get really good coverage of the stems and the leaves. So that's, uh, that's what makes us a little bit different. This slide is one that uh, uh, Dr. Jim Speck put together. It basically is a planting date slide, but what it does, it shows you the size of the canopy. If we plant on time, by the time we're making some of our foliar applications, we have a very large canopy to kind of penetrate. Of course, if you're planting later, that's not the story. But if you plant it on time, you can get some pretty significant foliage to try to get those droplets through. So there's five characteristics that we really got to pay attention to. Volume, droplet size, pressure, boom height and ground speed. And we really do have to account for all five of those. So the first one is spray volume because it's the most important. You always wanna apply at least 15 gallons per acre when you're using fungicides and insecticides. Uh, 20 gallons per acre would be preferred. Um, and especially if you got large plants and dense canopies. So some of the factors that affect spray volume are ground speed, uh, nozzle type um, and pressure. Droplet size is the second most important factor, and this is one I think that's overlooked a lot um, because remember, we got to get good penetration and good coverage. If the droplets are too small, they'll give us really excellent coverage, but they won't be able to penetrate the canopy to get into where they need to, to do their job. If the droplets are too large, they'll have the momentum to get into the canopy, but they won't cover the leaf surface or the stem surface to give us the kind of uh, protection that we need. So it's really a, a balancing act. And what we've arrived at is fine to medium sized droplets are best. 200 to 350 microns are the recommended for optimum uh, penetration and coverage. So the engineers and, and spray companies classify their droplet size using symbols and color codes outlined by um, a standard developed by the Agricultural Society of Ag and Biological Engineers. Um, they refer to nozzle catalogs for this information. Every nozzle catalog has charts that talk about the droplet size for their nozzles. And I'll show you some examples. There's some factors that affect droplet size. Pressure is the one that we think of the most, but also the nozzle selection is another one. So this is a chart that shows the, um, how the spectra is qualified in the catalogs, and they do this by color. So it goes everywhere from extremely fine all the way to ultra coarse. And these colors represent the, um, the droplet size. Please don't confuse these with the color of the nozzle body because they're not correlated whatsoever. So where we really want to choose when we're looking at charts, we really want to be in that yellow to orange category, that, that medium to fine category, more precisely, probably the fine end of the medium category. And I'll show you an example. So pressure is the next thing you want to consider. It affects droplet size, spray volume, and, and velocity of those droplets. Higher pressures can provide better canopy penetration only if you're not sacrificing droplet size. You're not creating too many fine droplets. You remember, you got to maintain that medium kind of droplet size. 40 PSI is generally recommended for conventional flat fan nozzles. 
Boom height is an important characteristic. And I think this one's misunderstood a lot of times when we're play, spraying uh, post-emergence in canopies. It all has to do with where our target critters are, our target pest is. And with soybeans, it's down inside the canopy. It's not that top of the canopy, it's down inside the canopy. And so we do need to be directing our products down into the canopy a little bit. So the minimal boom heights for flat fan nozzles are listed there. For an 80 degree nozzle, it's 17 to 19 inches. For a 110 degree flat fan, it's 16 to 18. Really in soybeans, we wanna locate that target about two thirds of the height of the canopy or one third from the top of the canopy is a reasonable place to place the target. If the plants are very, very tall, the target is maybe that top five inches. Uh, so five inches below the top of the canopy. But again, it's never the very top of the canopy. This sort of shows an example why we do that. Our overlap is important to get uniform distribution, uniform pattern. And then we do target kind of this midpoint or top third of the canopy rather than targeting the top. So an example, if we got 110 degree flat fan nozzles, 20 inch nozzle spacing, and our canopy is 24 inches tall, where do, where is our, where do we run the boom? So this example shows that. So here we are with, um, with our target about 16 inches off the ground. The canopy is 24. We really, and we got to get our, our minimum height here of 16 to 18 inches. We really want to run that boom probably 10 to 12 inches above the top of the canopy. It doesn't give you a lot of room for error, but it really does get the product where we need it to be in a uniform distribution. Ground speed is really important, uh, one of the most important, because there's an inverse relationship. If we uh, double our ground speed, we cut, cut our volume in half. If we decrease our ground speed, we double our volume we're distributing. So very, very important. Um, we don't want to drive too fast because that doesn't let the droplets go into the canopy as much. We, I know you don't want to hear this, but try to keep your ground speed at 10 miles per hour or less in large soybean canopies. Nozzle selection is really, really important. You want to consider spray volume, nozzle pressure, ground speed. Uh, Dr. Ozkan found that if we're spraying uh, products and we really need good coverage, a flat fan pattern, a single flat fan pattern is best. Not the twin jets or even twin nozzles put on a, on a nozzle body. Those are really good for spraying wheat heads, but they're not good for getting um, droplets into a, a, an intense or dense soybean canopy. This chart really is important. It sort of summarizes everything that I just talked about. If you don't take anything else away from today, please uh, refer to your catalogs about and look for this chart. So this shows two different nozzle types, um, an XR04 and an XR05. Um, and uh, what it does, it puts everything all in one chart. It's got the pressure, it's got the droplet size, it's got the miles per hour that you're traveling, and the gallons per acre that are applied. So remember, I said we wanted to really target 15 gallons per acre. So to get 15 gallons per acre, we really need to look at this XR um, 05s and particularly the 110 05 at 40 pounds of pressure. It produces medium droplets. Remember I said we wanted to be on the fine end of the medium. It's just above the fine. So this is where we wanna be. If we operate that sprayer at 10 miles an hour, there's our 15 gallons per acre. It's just a perfect fit. So that works really well. Now, if we wanted to run an 04 nozzle, we would have to travel at eight miles per hour to get our 15 miles per gallon. It just produces that much less, less volume um, through the orifice. Still 40 PSI, we could run either an 80 degree nozzle or a 110 degree nozzle. Either one would work to give us our 15 gallons per acre. It's really an important chart. I would recommend you being familiar with that if you're gonna be applying foliar fungicides, insecticides or fertilizers in, in soybean canopies. All of the things that I talked about have been summarized in this handout. This is also in the chat, um, but I'll just, uh, um, Click it and it should take you to this page and you can download this, uh, this two-page uh, um, document. 
So that's really all I have for today. I just want to thank the Soybean Checkoff for paying half of my salary and operating and making this possible. I want to thank Dr. Ozcon for his input in this. And I do want to encourage those of you that are making applications in larger soybean canopies to pay attention to this information because those products are expensive. And if you want to maximize their efficacy, uh, paying attention to your equipping and operating your sprayer will, will return money. So that's all I've got. All right, perfect, Mike. All right, so getting into the question and answer portion of today's virtual breakfast series, I see we have a couple questions in the chat box. Uh, Mark Seaman has a question uh, for Mike. Uh, question is, some post herbicides such as Liberty are needing a higher spray volume, uh, targeting 20, 20 gallons per acre. Can a sprayer be set up for this herbicide application and also use it for a fungicide and foliar fertilizer later? Yes. Um Mark, you can do that in this particular case. When I was thinking herbicides, I was thinking more of the uh, systemic herbicides that uh, we have to be careful with uh, uh, preventing drift. And so we do recommend larger droplets uh, with those. And uh, um, But no, with Liberty, we want really good coverage. So I think the same setup would work for insects, diseases, foliar fertilizers, and uh, a herbicide that requires really good contact like, like Liberty. So I don't think there's any challenges there in changing that. The only thing is just be aware that those medium to fine droplets are going to be more susceptible to drift. Now, one thing I do want to mention is that Dr. Ozcon, who is I based a lot of my information on, has joined us today from mm -hmm. Ohio State. He's an ag engineer focusing on, on application technologies. Uh, Dr. Ozcon, welcome. And I just want to encourage uh, more questions because uh, the, we do have the expert with us today. So if you have um, sprayer setup or operation questions, Dr. Oskan is with us for the remainder of the morning. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so Steve, are there any other questions for either for myself or maybe mm -hmm. Dr. Oskan? Um, Not at this time. Uh, we do have one question for Jeff, but uh, maybe some more questions will start rolling in. Um, Jeff, the question for you again is from Mark. Um, it's a uh, prediction for rain sounds this morning sounds good, um, but the weather radar looks disappointing. Um, he assumes this means that more moisture will be popping up on the radar. How does this happen with such dry conditions in our state? Right. Yeah, it's it's a good question, and and uh, I think the the issue is today, and, and there, there's a couple couple pieces of this, but one is that probably going to be two rounds of, of precip. One, one we're seeing now in northern parts of the state, and that that's going to gradually come to an end over the next couple of hours. But the other part of the this is uh, there will be redevelopment this afternoon. And the reason that there's redevelopment, and we've seen, we haven't seen this very often this spring and, and early summer, but the, the atmospheric conditions are going to become much, much better for convection, for, for thunder showers and thunderstorms to form. Again, especially in the uh, the southeastern part of the lower peninsula, enough warmth, actually some water vapor, some, some humidity there ahead of that frontal boundary, so that the ingredients to cause showers and thunderstorms are, are it, they're, they're not there for very long, just for a few hours, but they're going to be there. And uh, so we, we will likely see another area, it'll blossom. And I, my guess is right now, I'd say probably mid afternoon, uh, two or three o'clock and then continuing on into the early evening. That's that's gonna be, and, and the other great thing about this is the timing of that system as it goes through. It, it's today, it's coinciding with some of the warmest time of the day. That's a good, well, it's a good thing if you want precip because it's when the atmosphere is most unstable. So that's that's a positive thing and that's why we're we're pretty becoming more and more optimistic that at least in the again that eastern part of the state we should see redevelopment and a and a pretty active radar here uh, later in the day. And again, Jeff, that's a uh, concentration for afternoon precipitation on more towards the east side of the state. Correct. Yes. Yeah. There'll be it, there might be a few of these that develop uh, in in the western lower, but I think most of it most of it will probably be around 127 uh, and then east of that into the, uh, again, into the thumb and especially into the Southeast. I think the Southeast is where we'll probably see some of the highest concentration. Uh, and even then it's not gonna be this huge, uh, huge event that gets everybody with a half an inch or better. We won't see that, but there will be, I think there will be some heavier thunderstorms in there that that some people do pick up the half an inch. Most most other areas, uh, a quarter of an inch. And, and as we've seen so often, 
this year. Unfortunately, there still will be places that that will be largely missed or, or just see you know a few hundreds. That's that's just that's sort of where we are. And 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 Mark, you mentioned about the dry landscape. That's some of that the feedback in there. It's uh, the old saying from the plains: uh, drought begets drought. Uh, dry landscape does matter, and and some of that water vapor that goes into the precipitation, of course, does come from the landscape. And if it's already really dry, it just takes more water vapor from somewhere else. So there is a there is a link there. We don't see it that often here in Michigan because of our climate, but once in a while, when we have a situation like now, the the landscape and that real large large areas of of dry landscape, it it can make a difference. Excellent, thanks, Jeff. Um, we've got another question pertaining to weather, but also pertaining to entomology and bugs. Um, so I'm hoping Chris Defonso's on here. You she just popped up wonderful. So the question is, Chris, uh, with the current dry weather situation, does it impact either way for insects? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. So yeah, it depends on the insect. So moths, for instance, you know, they don't feed as adults, but they certainly need water to make eggs. So sometimes when it's dry, you get a lot of um death of the egg masses or they're reabsorbed so that they're not even laid. But when I see this dry weather, the first thing that I think about is some of these sucking insects do better. Either they're not killed by the natural fungi that are out there or their damage is, is exacerbated. So something like potato leafhopper, soybean aphid, or spider mite that could be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, spider mite is certainly the really the, the most difficult one. It's not an insect. Uh, it's difficult to manage. The products can be more expensive. There's there's limitations. Some some products kill only adults. Some don't kill the eggs. So if we get in a situation where we're going to be managing spider mite, it's almost like a losing battle because you could spray to the cows come home. And we're not used to spraying up here for spider mite like they are someplace down in Texas where they spend so much money on it. But spider mites, certainly, they're going to start along those the, the edges of fields typically, especially like the dusty dirt road. So that dust kind of lands on the plants and dries them out even more. And that's where these populations will start. You'll see a little bit of yellowing. So I'm, that's what I'm keeping my eye out. I've got to go up to the thumb next week. And as I drive... That's what I'm going to be looking for is it's so early, you know, some of these plants are so small, but there's definitely spider mite is, is my biggest concern right now. Chris, along with that on alfalfa, uh, of course, potato leaf hoppers are always a concern. Right. And is that something, how, how soon after we see the alfalfa start to emerge, should we start to scout for leaf hoppers? So you can start almost immediately. I mean, if you're really managing your alfalfa well, then you're on a weekly schedule to walk that field with a with a sweep net and and you know, remember the opposite side of the net, you have your measuring stick because that threshold for leafhopper changes as the alfalfa grows. So when you see yellowing, something's already happening to that alfalfa. You're trying to avoid when you get the yellowing and the hopper burn. And in dry beans too. I mean, I know we're, you know, that that's a little bit down down the road but when you put drought on top of potato leaf hopper it's a it's almost like a symbiotic kind of thing you get more damage than you would have in an in a normal year so phil you're right you need to be out in those fields and make a point of it not driving by looking for the yellowing you're you're out there before the yellowing is is happening 55 miles an hour doesn't work right yes yeah so get a sweep net you can get one at vesterberg at the uh Great Lakes IPM, that should be your friend. That's the one insect where having a sweep net, you know, really does a lot of a lot of good for for scouting. Excellent information. Any other comments, Chris, Phil, on that question? I'm just waiting for the well, but, spider mite shoe to drop. That's what I'm waiting for. So yeah, do you do you have an estimate on on maybe when that could take place? No, I think like in the very worst years that we've ever had, you know, I think about 4th of July is my start to think okay. about mites, but I, it's almost like I'm backing that up by a week, you know, thinking if it remains dry. And again, this is all on Jeff. It's all his fault. So, yeah. uh, yeah. I see we have some spray questions, so maybe we should yeah. get to those because we sure. have a, a guest, you know, to. Absolutely. 
So uh, Bill, Bill had a question. His question was, are there any specific changes in sprayer setup for fungicides when using a PWM systems? And Dr. Oskan uh, typed in the chat box, uh, not really same recommendations apply to booms with PWM systems. Um, any other comments uh, about that, Dr. Oskan or uh, Mike Staten specifically? I'll defer to Dr. Oskan. I, uh, as I mentioned in my chat uh, uh, answer, I, whether you're using a PWM system or uh, just conventional nozzle setup, uh, it really doesn't matter. The PWM system uh, is just uh, changing the flow rate if needed. Um, uh, nothing is changing in the, the spray uh, setup. Um, so I um, I think that's a clear answer. It just just think of uh, your PWM system as uh, just like a, a conventional system in terms of the boom height and um, and all the other requirements uh, that that you you need to meet when you're spraying uh, soybeans. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Oskan. Uh, Brian Alt's question, what can we expect corn to look like with this prolonged drought? Shorter plants? And uh, uh, Manny responded, drought in these stages result in reduced stem and leaf cell expansion. So yeah, shorter plants with less leaf area. Um, again, uh, Manny, I don't know if you care to comment on that further, but that seems pretty straightforward. Um, the drought is um, very much affecting the corn plants uh, in this early emergent stage. Eric Anderson, um, Manny, do you have any comments? Okay, yep. Eric, no, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's good. Yeah, it's pretty okay. I think the only comment I had was like as the corn is approaching this V6, you know, V7 stage, it's already starting to determine number of kernels, number of rows. So we might already start to see like some potential impact of drought on some of our yield components, right? It's still mainly genetically driven. Uh, if we stay in this drought, you know, going into V10, V12, that's when number of kernels per row are determined. And I think that's more environmentally driven. So okay. we'll have a bigger impact if we continue to, to, to stay in this period. Excellent. Thanks, Manny. Um, Eric Anderson has a question. Are there any, I think this is for Mike, um, are there any mid or late post herbicide applications that would require a different setup than with fungicides or insecticides? that would otherwise be ideal for a tank mix. Yeah, I think it gets back to that drift and 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 how the mode of action kind of is it a is it a systemic or is it a contact? If it's a contact, I would say it's be very compatible with the fungicide the setup for fungicide and insecticides. If it's a systemic type of product, which most of ours are, you know, you think of dicamba, 2,4-D, um, uh, glyphosate certainly. Um, then we want larger droplets. We really need to prevent drift with those. So I would say the setup would not be compatible if you're using anything that you don't want to drift just because of the size of the droplets. Um, you really want larger droplets on those products and we want uh, medium sized droplets on, on the fungicides, insecticides and foliar fertilizers to try to get more leaf and stem coverage. So I think that's, that's probably would be the way I'd answer that. Excellent. Uh, Mike Sherman Reed has a question. Any setup or usage tips for the old style two to 400 pole type sprayer with a 30 foot boom? Oh, I'll take a stab at this, but then Dr. Dr. Rose kind of like your opinion too. Um, the first thing that comes to mind in the scenario, Sherman, that we're talking about, about uh, larger soybean canopies, I would really hate to see you drive through uh, the crop, even in 30 inch row spacings uh, with, with this type of technology, 30 foot booms, you're just going to be making so many tire tracks and sprayer tracks in the field. So that'd be my first concern. And uh, there's been some data out of Purdue that shows that tire tracks do really impact you yield once we get past that um, R1 growth stage. So um, yeah, I, I just think uh, that's something to be concerned about. Other than that, I don't think the technology would change. I, I think it'd be same boom height, same nozzles, same nozzle spacing, uh, same pressures, everything would be the same. It's just, it's got me concerned that you're going to have so much tire traffic in um, pulling that sprayer through a large soybean canopy. Dr. Oskan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, Mike, I, I just replied to that question briefly, but uh, some of these old um, 
booms, uh, regardless of the size of the, uh, the boom, they have a tendency to bounce up and down, up and down um, as you drive, especially if you're driving at a high speed. So I think someone with an old sprayer with a boom that doesn't have the self-leveling uh, characteristics should try to slow down and, and look at the how the boom is moving up and down. And um, sometimes I, I've seen uh, farmers uh, putting uh, uh, some wheels uh, at the end of the boom uh, without damaging the, 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 the rows of soybeans in the field, of course, so that the boom doesn't go down any more than uh, what it should. Uh, so those are the two recommendations uh, that I would mention. Good. Thank you. Perfect. I think that that is all the questions that we have so far. We did Steve, have, yep. I did ask uh, Dr. Ozkan one, though you may not have seen it because I just sent it to him specifically. Yeah. Um, so could I ask Dr. Ozkan to comment on that? Absolutely. It would be dealing with these large booms, Dr. Ozkan, and you did put it in the chat, but maybe just if you could uh, verbally elaborate on your answer. These large booms, 120-foot booms, we're asking them to operate those booms maybe only a foot above the canopy. Boy, if they get any bounce or so, they could you know, be into that canopy or something. So what, what can they do to reduce the bounce, the sway on these large booms? And is it possible if we're only shooting to keep it 12 inches above the canopy? Some of those uh, large booms, uh, you know, 120 foot boom, if if they are fairly new, uh, that is purchased recently, they come with some sort of a a sensor, a, a sonar sensor, and in, in, uh, in more than one sections, uh, could be two sonars, uh, especially towards the the end section uh, of the boom there is always some sort of a sensor that is going to keep the boom height, uh, whatever the, the boom height that you set up. Uh, so that, that, that is almost becoming a standard uh, uh, equipment in, in new booms with the really heavy chassis. Um, uh, the new booms are over 120 or 120 foot boom, they are really, uh, sturdier than the ones that we see and they they have a better self leveling mechanism so that the you, you know undulations on the ground is not going to affect the boom height as much um and and again having having some sort of a sensor helps if if nothing else th those wheels that i mentioned you uh, it's almost like a small bicycle tires. Um, you can add them to to the end of the boom, especially if you don't have a, a, a some sort of a sensor. That's going to keep your boom at the, the proper level. So again, uh, with the te technological advancements in boom design and uh, sensors, get more sturdier. Uh, booms and the technological advancements uh, by adding sensors. If not, uh, having the some sort of wheels uh, on the end, at the end of the uh, on both sides of the boom is really going to be help you uh, stay remain that uh, proper boom height. Uh, as Mike uh, mentioned to you, boom height is critical. Um, getting the right amount of product from the nozzles getting 20 gallons per acre is not the the end of the story it, it is just the beginning that's one side of the coin the other side of the coin is uniformity you want to make sure that you don't have streaks or heavy um, uh, the material coming from uh, across the boom if you to to maintain that uniformity, you have to really pay attention to two things: uh, spray angle of the nozzles and the recommended height for those nozzles. Uh, they, they are given in catalogs or uh, 
uh, spray manufacturers recommend the boom height, proper boom height, uh, so that you have proper overlap and uh, uniform uh, application across the boom. Good. Thank you, Dr. Oskan. All right. So we've got uh, another question uh, for Dr. Oskan. Um, it's just a comment about any new technologies that you see in the next few years that maybe you can comment on, maybe where you see this industry or spray technology going? Um, I think the, the biggest improvement that we have made in spray technology is adding the pulse width modulation system. That is eventually going to be a standard um, uh, equipment in, in especially large booms um, that is going to help you uh, change the application rate uh, we have not been we have not achieved that yet in large scale uh, it can be done but a lot of these things are still in the research stages um, changing the rates is not that is uh, pretty much for fertilizer applications, for example, or, uh, um, but, but when you get, when you come to fungicide applications and uh, insecticide applications, variable rate application is going to be a little bit, uh, uh, more difficult. How do you identify the uh, areas that you have? more problems or less or no problems uh, so you have to get a map ahead of so you, you have to make some sort of a pass over the field by either aerially uh, taking some photographs or some sensors uh, so right now we really don't have a very good sensing mechanism to detect number of aphids that you may have more of them in one part of the field or the other or none in some areas uh, uh, of course, the aphids will once you once they start getting populated. Uh, it's not going to take a long time to to have them uh, all over the field. So scouting is important um, for for the, the 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 variable rate application that I I mentioned. That is still not uh, on the labels. Uh, when you read the labels, they don't really mention uh, uh, determine such uh, statements like. Uh, uh, you know, get a, a map of infestation of the disease or insect in the field and um, use the PWM system to change the rates accordingly. That kind of language is not on the labels yet. I think we are getting to that point, but the key point is um, uh, for fungicide and insecticide applications, how do you determine where you need more or less the rest is easy. I think that that, that is the once you get a map uh, of of, uh, of insects or diseases, uh, the rest is easy. And you can program that PWM system, and it can change the flow rate when you get to a certain point in the field. Um, for weed identification, uh, we are getting much better. I think uh, probably uh, that's going to be become more reality down the road than uh, changing the rates depending on the fungicide and uh, insecticide applications. So with the drones that, that we can use today, uh, you can fly over the field and um, especially for uh, uh, targeted applications, you may have some, some parts of the field infested with some uh, residual uh, weeds and um, spot spraying, that's what I'm talking about. You, we can do that. Uh, if you if you want to do it using your own sprayer, a large uh, ground sprayer, uh, you will have to get a, a map of the field where you will see coordinates of the, the, the weeds in the field. Uh, and uh, you, then the second pass, that's uh, that weed map will be imported to the PWM system, and they can uh, we can have uh, each nozzle programmed separately or or sections. 
So that that can be done, uh, but the, uh, the drone spraying is becoming really um, uh, more popular, uh, getting a lot more attention. Uh, maybe at another meeting, uh, we can have a special section on that. Uh, what's going on with the the spray drones? Uh, and where we are with them. But right now we are almost getting close to real-time applications of uh, chemicals on the go um, for spot spraying. Uh, or um, again, if you have, a, if, you, if you cannot make on the go real-time application with drones, you have to fly over the field and get a map and then uh, Based on that map, uh, you, you can uh, program the drone nozzles to be turned on and off. So these things are coming up, uh, but we are really not in the true application stages right now with the drones. Um, the, la the labels don't specifically indicate you can use drones to spray pesticides. The labels don't still say uh, you can do variable application using the technology. You know, sometimes the technology is ahead of labels, sometimes uh, the other way around. But right now, uh, I think the technology is ahead of uh, the, the requirements, labeled requirements. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have one final question we're going to get to today from Josh Andrews. Uh, Mike, is there a point with dry land, soybeans, and corn that if the weather situation doesn't change in some way, that those investments in sprays and nitrogen maybe for corn um, will even be beneficial anyway? Can you comment on that? I can comment on soybeans, and I'll ask maybe uh, Dr. Singh to talk about corn or Kurt to talk about corn. But yes, yeah, certainly, um, white mold is a really good example. If we don't have the weather conditions that are favorable for white mold, then we really don't need to pull the trigger and put an application on. And Marty and his colleagues have developed a white mold uh, 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 apothecia prediction tool, a uh, sporecaster that will help us do that. So I'd encourage people to run that if they're thinking about making a white mold application. Some of the um in uh we really typically don't have and i'll let chris correct me but we really typically don't have to spray for insecticides in michigan insects in michigan very often uh ever since the out aphid outbreaks really um we just have not had um over the threshold need to spray for insects so um I think some growers do it because it's cheap, but we can have some downsides of doing that. So that leaves um, foliar fertilizers. We really have not seen a consistent uh, response to foliar fertilizers in Michigan, maybe a 10% uh, profitability uh, percentage. So some of that might be the application technology, but some of it just might be that it's just hard to get those nutrients into the plant. Let's let the roots take the nutrients into the plant and let the leaves conduct photosynthesis and and uh, conduct uh, uh, transpiration. So um, I think that's, I, I think it's a point well taken. Um, and I think he's right on the disease side. What about on the nitrogen side for corn? Manny or Kurt? They might have uh, dropped off, um, Mike, but I think that it's a really good stopping point, just talking about specifically soybeans for today. Um, okay. Thank you for that that example. I did happen to find the, the app link on our website I shared with everybody. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Mike, thank you. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us today and sharing um, a weather report and this topic. I think it's very timely. Um, and uh, we'll see everybody next week, hopefully, for our um, virtual breakfast series as we continue on. Thanks, have a great day.